as Christians living in the United States at the least, we don't normally fear of overt persecution for speaking boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to look at uh, a promise that we have that I think would in, should encourage us as believers and hopefully encourage us in helping encourage others that maybe aren't so bold. Uh, we have a country that, at least at the present time, and has through most of its history, or through its history, has granted us freedom of speech, and that allows us to speak freely, and has allowed us freedom of religion, and allowed us to practice that religion freely. God is never anywhere in the scriptures guaranteed that we will have those rights given to us by any government. In fact, the early church was came into its existence in systems that were hostile towards Christianity. And through much of the history of the world, Christians have lived in places that were hostile to biblical Christianity. I'm Pastor Tim Holscher, and we are looking at some things that God's promised for those who are loving him. And as we're loving him, those things that he's promised for us, a spiritual believer is able to evaluate them because of regeneration. He has the mind or the kind of mind that Christ has so he can evaluate them as he's directed by the Spirit to see that these things have value, to not minimize or treat them as insignificant, but as important, as valuable. And so today I want to go over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy has been called by some people Paul's swan song. Paul is on death row. Uh, he is going to die. In fact, he says in the closing chapter, he's already just about to be poured out or being poured out. He's expecting his death to be very near. And so he's writing this last letter to Timothy, encouraging uh, Timothy and encouraging Timothy to come because Paul has items and things in Rome that he wishes for Timothy to come and apparently collect. And says, but Timothy, because he knows all of this and he knows what, Tim, what Paul is suffering, Timothy is in danger of being timid. Verse 7, 2 Timothy chapter 1, For did not God did not give us a spirit, and I am understanding this spirit here to be the Holy Spirit. If we look down just very quickly, down in verse 14, he says, protect or guard than the good thing that has... I don't think entrusted to you. I don't. I think there's a different point to that. But through the Holy Spirit who lives within us or dwells in us. So I believe he is referring here to the Holy Spirit. And he says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. And this is not our normal word for uh, phabos or phabeo, the to fear. This is the word dilias. Uh, dilia referred to a timidity, uh, 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 caution to, to act. And so it does fall within the gamut of what we would call fear. And because he says he hasn't given us a spirit of fear, it may, he, Paul may be implying very likely that there is another spirit that does bring fear, and that's Satan and his uh, cohorts. They operate, they use fear. Paul tells us that, or the writer of Hebrews, if you don't think that that's Paul in Hebrews 2, states that um, that Satan or the devil actually has manipulated people through the fear of death. He's enslaved them to do the things he wants. But Paul says, but God has not given us a spirit of this timidity to be timid, to be cowardly, to, shall we say, hold our tongue when there's something that God wants us to say. But it's a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. So number one, don't be ashamed of the testimony. It's kind of showing you the nature of this timidity here, is that Timothy's kind of being ashamed, and ashamed in the sense that he's backing off and he doesn't know if he really wants to be bold and identified with that. Let's keep our head down and hope we don't get in trouble. Uh, but even more so, he goes on, or of me, the prisoner for his sake. But God's, by God's power, as he's been talking here in this context, by this, that God's given us the spirit of power, by that power, he says, you can actually share in the sufferings for the gospel. 
It's this part here where he says of me, I want us to think about this in this context a little bit. Timothy was in danger. Here, Paul has been the man that through, who, through whom we believe Timothy heard the gospel, probably heard him back in Acts 13 or 14 when Paul went through that area of Derby to begin with, and then picks Timothy up, finds that in the time between those visits, Timothy has distinguished himself among the disciples, and Paul wants to take Timothy along. And Timothy is actually matured enough that when Paul has to leave Thessalonica under the gun, he tells us in Thessalonians that he sent Timothy back. And if Timothy were not somebody that were that had matured and had become trustworthy, you wouldn't entrust them to go back and help take care of believers that were going through something hard due to persecution. So Timothy had matured. And Paul has left Timothy. In fact, this, le uh, well, it's at first Timothy, Paul tells us that, Timothy, I told you to stay behind in Ephesus while I went to other places because there were things in Ephesus that needed to be taken care of. And Timothy was mature enough to actually take care of some problems that were going on in that church. So this is this man, Timothy. And yet Timothy, in this context, is struggling with perhaps being ashamed of his best friend, his spiritual father in the faith. This one that has taken him under his wing and, and trained him and, and helped him, and now he's ashamed? How loving is that? He goes on down here, and if you notice in verse 15 towards the end of chapter 1, he says, You know that everyone in the province of Asia, or and this would be Asia Minor, what we would know as Turkey today, they have deserted or abandoned me, withdrawn from me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. But he says, may the Lord grant mercy to the family of Onesphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my imprisonment. Notice verse 17, how different than this, this is from where Timothy is. But when he arrived or when he came to be in Rome, he diligently or eagerly sought me out and found me. He just didn't kind of casually, maybe, hopefully, might bump into Paul where, you know, is he, oh, the house that he's renting as a prisoner is over there. No, he actually made a strong, concerted effort. And there may have been other people going, Paul, why do you want to know where he is? He's a prisoner. He's under lock and key. He is chained to a Roman soldier. What do you want to be with that guy for? And Onesphorus could have said, oh, I'm sorry. Could have said, hey, he's my friend. He's my friend. We... We are worshipers of the one true God. I don't know exactly know what Onesphorus said, but he may have said these things. And it's different than what Timothy is doing. Now, just put, put those two. And Paul's encouraging Timothy, don't go down this path. Don't be. He knows Timothy's in danger of it. He hasn't actually become ashamed, but he's in danger of going down that path. Because he can tell that Timothy's struggling with being a coward, with being timid with being afraid to open his mouth and identify himself with the gospel. And, of course, then with Paul, who has enunciated that gospel, has pronounced that. If you know somebody that is actually standing for the faith, I'm not talking about, and this is, I really want to state this carefully, I'm not talking about somebody yelling at the world about political issues. I'm not talking about somebody yelling at the world about social issues. I am talking about somebody that, is not afraid as they operate in the world to tell people this is who Jesus Christ is and this is what he's done to provide salvation. It's in that kind of a context, in that kind of a background, that if you knew somebody was doing that and you don't, you want to avoid them, you don't want to be around them, you want to disassociate with your, yourself from them, that's not loving. So, with that said, what would we say back up here would be a thing that God has promised for those who are loving him. Well, they're using the Spirit, and along with the Spirit comes power and self-control, the ability to actually keep a, a proper attitude in the middle of these things. And it's the opposite of operating by fear. And I can guarantee you, people that operate and make decisions out of fear, they're not happy with those decisions. It may kind of temporarily make them feel a little bit better that they're uh, that they didn't get themselves in trouble, but it also leaves them kind of hollow and empty. But a believer that operates by power and actually exercises love, and in this case, love towards Paul, that would be encouraging. That would be helpful. And that would encourage them and Paul as well as others to have a 
good day in the Lord. Thank you for joining me today.